Okay, so we're doing the last lecture of this unit. Look how many days. That's it. Right there. For the whole semester. We don't have much time left. There's no yays for that. Okay. So um, today is very heavy calculation based. These are the biggest. These are really the only calcs that we have in the unit. And these are calculations using colligative properties. Here is the definition. Colligative properties are properties that depend on the number of molecules or ions, solute molecule or ions, that are in a solution. And these particular properties are changed based on the number of those in solution. Okay? doesn't really matter what those particles are. It's the number that affects these conditions. And they are vapor pressure, boiling point, and freezing point. There's a fourth one that we're not going to actually do calculations with, but I want you to know it in case. It's osmotic pressure. For those of you who take um, AP Bio, you're going to actually do some labs and do some osmotic pressure calculations, but we don't deal with it in AP Chem. There is an osmotic pressure equation on the AP equation sheet that I'll go over with you tomorrow just to show you where it is, but it's traditionally not tested on the AP. So let's start with, um, we'll kind of do boiling point and vapor pressure at the same time. I want to talk about why a solute affects these. So if we have a pure solvent, so those are all my solvent molecules. Okay. So when a, sol a solvent boils, we know that the molecules gain enough energy to go in the gaseous state. So that's going to be a set value, that boiling point. And when the water boils, or whatever's in there boils, the solvent boils, some will go in the gaseous state. And what does this cause when these molecules up here pound into each other in the size of the container? Pressure, specifically vapor pressure. Okay. What happens when I throw a solute in there? These solute molecules kind of block the way for the molecules in the liquid phase to get out to the gaseous phase. So what happens to boiling point? What do you think? It raises the boiling point. We have to put more energy into this system in order to get those red molecules to escape now. Okay? This is a very simplistic way of saying this. I just want you to know. So if I have to put more energy in, boiling point is elevated. Okay? Now, what happens to vapor pressure then? If I have more stuff here blocking, what happens to the number of these molecules? They decrease, so what happens to vapor pressure? Vapor pressure decreases. Okay? Think of it this way. If I said, we're, like, we're all water, okay, and I want to boil us. And for us to be in the gas phase, we all have to run out that door. Okay? So let's we do that. Great. No problem. But what happens if I fill this room with a bunch of Chuck E. Cheese, the ball pit balls. And then say, go to the door. You think that would take more energy? Heck yeah. It would be a lot harder. I'd be tired. I would just drown in the balls. I wouldn't even try. I would just sit on the floor until someone came and got me. Um, so that's kind of the concept, OK? Now, what about freezing point? Well, when stuff freezes, what does it have to do? Let's look at specifically water, because we know water is one of the only things that expands as it freezes. What has to happen to these molecules when they freeze? Julian says they have to line up. That's correct. Okay. So if they're moving around doing their thing, and then they have to line up exactly in order to get these intermolecular forces attracted to each other, what's going to happen when I throw stuff in there? It gets in the way, right? So the molecules have to slow down even more, lose even more energy to give them that opportunity to wiggle through and line up appropriately. So we get freezing point depression. Here's the best way I can explain it. And I'm going to draw it, but I want you to do it with your hands because I want the people at home to see this. So you, I want you to put your hands out like that, straight out. Okay? So what this is, this is your thermometer. This is the freezing point, I'm sorry, boiling point, and this is the freezing point. Okay, so your hands are at the lines of a thermometer. What happens when you add a solute to a solvent? Open your hands. Okay, when you open your hands, you see that goes up and this goes down, right? So freezing point, you can put your hands down now, y'all are a bunch of dorks. <laughs> freezing point depresses, boiling point elevates. Okay, 
That's what you need to remember. Because when you do the math, you need to know, do I add the change in temperature to the boiling point or subtract? Well, you add it to it because the boiling point increased. And the same thing with freezing. You have to subtract it from its original boiling point. So there's some math equations associated with this. Vapor pressure of a pure, I didn't mean to put a V, I meant to put a P. Vapor pressure of a, of a solution is equal to the vapor pressure of a solvent times the mole fraction of a solvent. This right here is the biggest student mistake. Students want to do mole fraction of a solute. It's got to be solvent, so be careful here. We're going to practice this in a minute. And then these two um, particular things have these two equations. These two equations are very similar. So the change in temperature of our boiling is equal to what we call the boiling constant times molality times something called the Van Hoff factor. And I'll go over this on the next slide. This is the exact same formula. But instead of B, we say F for freezing, times molality times the Van Hoff factor. So what are some real life applications to this? Why do we use um, antifreeze in our cars? What does it do? Lowers the freezing point, so the water will eventually freeze at a much lower temperature. Is that really useful in Texas though? No, but we still need antifreeze. Why? It's the opposite. Actually, for us, we should call it anti-boil because it raises the boiling point because that's when we need it the most. And, you know, and there are times it does freeze here where we do need it in there. Um, but just know, remember, the way that thermometer goes, it takes care of both ways for us. Um, salt on the roads, right? I had my neighbor um, when I was on crutches. Y'all missed me during my whole knee surgery fiasco. I had multiple knee surgeries and I was on crutches and wheelchairs for eight weeks at a time. And I came out and she had this teeny little salt shaker on the stairs. She was being really sweet. I mean, I felt really bad because I'm on the second and a half floor. I had like two and a half. So I always had to go down on my butt trying to get down the stairs so I wouldn't slide on my crutches in the ice. She was like shaking little bits of salt with her itty bitty salt shaker. I'm, I felt so bad. I'm like, bless her heart. That doesn't work because you need way higher molality solution to get that to actually <laughs> change the freezing point. But thanks. <laughs> I didn't tell her that. I felt really bad. So anyway, um, we'll be talking about more real, real life examples throughout. But have you all ever heard the wise tale about adding salt to make your food cook faster? Okay. Or actually what they say is salt makes water boil faster. That's actually not true. It doesn't make it boil faster, but if you put enough in what it does, it raises what? The boiling point. So it actually boils at a higher temperature. So you're cooking at a higher temperature, so you can cook things faster. But it doesn't make it boil faster. Okay, so don't let people tell you that. There's also the thing that if you freeze hot water, it freezes faster than cold water. I've heard that. I'm like, you are weird because that is so not even possible. I'll show you a butt diagram that says otherwise. I never tell people that. Though. All right, so let's go on to do some, some math. This is just a, another description of vapor pressure in the same way that you guys already saw me draw. So the, this is Raoult's law, the vapor pressure law. You already saw this similar to this when you guys did the mole fraction of partial pressures of gases. We're dealing with partial pressures of gases here. So this is the exact same thing. The pressure of the solution is the vapor pressure of the solvent and the solute altogether. Okay? Um, it's actually the vapor pressure of just the solvent above the solution because we're dealing with solutes that are not volatile. And the sol X of solvent is the mole fraction of the solvent. And then this is the pure vapor pressure of the solvent. That's easy. We'll just, you'll see it when we do it. And then this one here, um, this formula is pretty important. Change in temperature of our freezing point or boiling point is in degrees Celsius. K of freezing is, um, and every substance has its own K.
the K of water, the Kf and the Kb of water on, are on the AP equation sheet. But since you don't have an AP equation sheet with you right now, go ahead and jot it down. It's 1.86 degrees Celsius times kilograms over um, moles. K boiling is easy for me to remember because I'm going to tell you how to remember it. Um, we're in Texas, right? It boils in Texas because it's so hot. What's our area code here in Austin? 0.512. This trick doesn't work when I go teach in other places. So anyway, that's the boiling. 0 0.512, same units, degrees Celsius, kilograms per mole. Okay, M is molality in both equations. We know molality is what? Review, moles of solute over kilograms of solvent, right? So this is really moles over kg. Now this I, what is this I? This I is called the Van Hoff factor, okay? And what that tells you is how many pieces your solute breaks up into. The more pieces your solute breaks up into, the larger effect it has on the freezing point and boiling point because more of it's getting in the way of the solvent trying to escape into gas phase or trying to freeze. Okay, so if I have a non-electrolyte like glucose or any organic substance that you know nothing about, it doesn't split up and it stays as one. So non-electrolytes or organic substances they all have a Van Hoff factor of one. Okay. If you have ionic compounds, you have to look at how many ions it's going to split up when it dissolves in the solvent. So what's the Van Hoff for sodium chloride? Two. What about um, calcium phosphate? Five. Calcium chloride? Three. Okay. So be careful with that. If it's something you don't know, like nicotine or urea or some crazy organic acid, benzoic acid or, um, I don't know, I can't think of anything else, um, anything like that, give it a one. When in doubt, give it a one. Because you're going to know the ionic ones when you see it. All right? Okay, let's do math. Get your calculators out. I need some speedy math people today. Calculate the expected vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius for a solution prepared by dissolving 97.4 grams of sucrose. And they were nice and gave us the molar mass of sucrose into 453 mils of H2O. Now to do this problem, it's kind of tricky because I'm not giving you all the information you need. And on your problems on the test, I'm going to give it to you. But we need the vapor pressure of the solution. What else do we need the vapor pressure of? What, Jessica? Just the pure solvent. I didn't give it to you, but remember we had a table. Okay. So the vapor pressure of H2O at 25 degrees Celsius, if you were to look it up on that table, is 23.76 torr. So that's something that you need to do this problem. So this is a Raoult's law problem. The vapor pressure of the solution is equal to the vapor pressure of the solvent, solvent times the mole fraction of what? The solvent. So that's moles of solvent over total moles. So let's go ahead and um, figure out. I'm just going to plug in. We're looking for the, the pressure of the solution. We know that the pressure of the solvent is 23.76 torr. So we're going to have to solve for this X. I'm going to do it over here in a different color. So to get the vapor pressure of, I mean not the vapor pressure, the mole fraction of the solvent, I need moles. What is my solvent in this case? Of water over moles of water plus moles of sucrose. This is the biggest student mistake. I can't even spell sucrose. This is the biggest student mistake. They want to put in moles of sucrose there on top. Uh -uh. It's going to be a big fraction like 0 0.8, 0 0.9. It's going to be more than half the solution if it's a solvent. 
Okay. So moles of water. How do I find moles of water? I have. Do I have my mills? Okay. There's an assumption I have to make. I'm going to assume grams. Why is that? Because I know the density of water at 25 degrees is one gram per mill, right? So to do moles of water, I'm going to do 453 grams over 18.02, okay? Plus, we'll figure that number out in a second, moles of water. Plus, we need moles of sucrose. How do I find that? Well, I know I have 97.4 over what? 342. So does someone want to just give me the number of moles of water first? I just want to write it down. Okay. Oops. Divided by 25.14. And what's the moles of sucrose? 97.4 divided by 342? 0.285? 0.285. All right, so what's my mole fraction then of just the solvent? Good, 0.989. And that's what I'm going to plug in here. And it's big. It needs to be big. If it's like 0.2 or something, you've messed up and you've done mole fraction of the solute, which is not right. So it's not going to change it a ton, and it shouldn't. Yeah, what'd you get? Anybody? 23 point... Let's go ahead and just stick with um, three sig figs. 23.5 tor. All right, next. The solution was prepared by adding 20 grams of urea to 125 grams of water. Yay, guess what we just made? <laughs> I was going to say urine, but y'all said pee. Okay, that's, I'm good with that. At 25 degrees Celsius, a temperature at with which pure water has a vapor pressure, so they're saying the vapor pressure of just water is equal to 23.76 millimeters of mercury. The, observe, the observed vapor pressure of the solution was found to be, so the vapor pressure once we added the urea, once we made our pee, is that. Calculate the molecular weight of urea. What do you think we need to solve for in Raoult's law? Mole fraction. Good. So we're going to take the vapor pressure of the solution is equal to the vapor pressure of the solvent times the mole fraction of the solvent. And we're going to solve for the mole fraction of the solvent. So we have the solution is 22.67 millimeters of mercury is equal to 23.76 times x. So tell me what the mole fraction of the solvent is. 0.954. All right, so now we need to break it down even further. If I'm looking for the molar mass of urea, what are the units of molar mass? Grams per mole. So I want grams of urea per mole of urea. I think they gave me grams of urea, didn't they? Yeah, I got that, 20.0 grams. But I need to find moles of urea. So how can I find moles of urea? I'm going to use my mole fraction. So I like this problem. <clears throat> All right. So this is 0.954 is equal to moles of what goes on top? water over moles of water plus urea. We're looking for that. Do I know moles of water? I can calculate it. 125 over 18.02. How many moles is that? Say it one more time louder. 6.94 divided by 6.94 plus, we don't know, urea's moles. What is urea's moles? Seven. Moles of urea is 0 0.37. Can you give me one more sig fig? 365. 
0 0.365. So that's the moles of urea. So I'm going to take that and put that here. So what is my molar mass of urea? We get 54.7 grams per mole. Okay, next problem. Calculate the freezing point and boiling point of a solution prepared by mixing 6 grams of glucose with 35 grams of water. 6 grams, and I, you know what, I want to change this. I need to show you a Van Hoff one, so we're going to make it calcium chloride. 6 grams of CaCl2 in 35.0 grams of H2O. So we want to do freezing and boiling point. Which do you want to do first? Doesn't matter to me. Boiling, I heard boiling first. Delta T of boiling is equal to Kb times I times M, or Mi, whichever. So we're looking for the, free, the boiling point. We know the K of boiling of water, since that's our solvent, it's based, that K is based on the solvent, because that's the thing that's changing the temperature, we're changing the temperature of. And um, we're going to make, check our units this time. It's degrees Celsius times kilograms over moles. Times the Van Hoff factor, well, does that CaCl2 split up into things? Yep, so it has a Van Hoff factor of 3. And then molality. Let's go ahead and do molality separately up here. Molality is equal to moles of solute over what? Kilograms of solvent. All right. Let's see. Six grams is my sol solvent. Solute, I mean, moles of solute. Six grams divided by what is the molar mass? Bless you. The molar mass of calcium chloride. One ten point nine eight. All right, so there's my molar mass. So that's moles of solute divided by how many kilograms of solvent do I have? Point zero three five. Okay. So what is my molality? One point one point one point five four and the units on molality are moles per kilogram so we're going to put that into this equation 1.54 moles per kilogram so I want to go ahead and check our units these moles cancel here kilograms cancel leaving us with degrees Celsius which is our change in temperature so our delta T of boiling is what 2.37 degrees Celsius. But is that what the question is asking? It's asking, calculate the freezing and boiling point. When does water usually boil? At 100. So now when is it going to boil? So we add to the boiling point. So it is 100, sorry, 102.37. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not going to look at sig figs on these. Because I don't want you to like decide to round to two sig figs and just give me 100 as an answer. So they're like, wait, I don't know if that's 100 from before or 100 from after. So just don't do that. Okay? All right. All right. So this makes the next one really easy because all we're doing now is freezing. So the only thing that's going to be different is our constant. Now our constant is 1.86 degrees Celsius kilograms per mole. We're still a Van Hoff of 3, and our molality is still 1.54 moles per kilogram. So what is our change in temperature of freezing? 8.59. All right, so we know that freezing point is depressed, so what is our freezing point then? We subtract from... Now, if it's not water, you're going to have to be given the boiling point in the problem, okay? And you will be. So we get negative 8.59 degrees Celsius. So this is freezing point. This is boiling point. Okay, next problem. A solution containing a non-electrolyte dissolved in water has a boiling point of 100.305. 
calculate the freezing point of the same solution. So we know that the boiling point, change of boiling point, is equal to Kb times M times I. I want to find the freezing point, though. Any ideas? Good. Find the molality in this equation, and then take it and plug it in down here, solving for what we're looking for. Okay, so we know, what is our delta, though? 100.305? No. What is our delta? 0 0.305. 0 0.305 degrees Celsius. I know Kb is 0.512 degrees Celsius kilogram molality. So, moles, I mean. Sulfur molality, molality. It says a non-electrolyte. So what's the bent Hoff factor? One. Good. So, someone tell me molality. 0.596. Moles per kilogram. So now I'm going to take that and plug it in here and solve for my freezing. 0.596 moles per kilogram times the molality from the problem above. No, sorry. I'm going to put K. That was the that was the molality. I need to put the K of 1.86 degrees Celsius kilogram per mole. And then my Van Hoff factor is still 1. So what is my change in the freezing temperature? I heard it 1.12. 1.1, 1 .1, is it 2? 1.11 degrees Celsius. Is that my actual freezing point? No, nope, we have to subtract it from, a hunt, from 0. So we get... That is the freezing point. Good. Next and last problem. What is the mass, molar mass of nicotine, if 5.04 grams of it? They don't give us the formula or anything because they want to know. They want us to figure out the molar mass using this as opposed to using the periodic table. So they're not telling us the formula. Um, if the compound changes at the freezing point of 90 grams of water by 0.647 degrees Celsius. So what do you think we need to solve for first? Molality is the only thing we can solve for with this given information. And then, remember, we want molar mass here, and that is grams per mole. They give me grams of the nicotine, and I want to know that molar mass, so i got to find moles of nicol nicol nicotine, nicotine from the molality of the solution. So that's the big picture. So let's go ahead now and solve. They told us this is freezing. All right. So I'm looking for, oh, they gave me the delta T. How much did it change by? 0.647. My freezing K is 1.86. I'm solving formality, and what's the Van Hoff factor? What do you think? One. I know nothing about it. It's an organic substance. I'm going to give it a one. So anyone give me molality? 0.348. And again, that's equal to moles of nicotine over kilograms of H2O. Huh. Do I know kilograms of H2O? Yeah, I do. So 0.348 is equal to moles over 0 0.0900. So what's my moles of nicotine? Say again. 0 0.03 what? 0 0.031. One more. Okay, let me three sig fig. So that's moles. So to get molar mass, I've got 5.04 grams per 0 0.0313 moles, and my final molar mass is 161 grams per mole. Yay! Good job, y'all. We are done.